Good evening, group. My name is Bill Falloon. I'm best known as a co-founder of the nonprofit Life Extension Foundation. I'm here, however, as an individual representing a new private association named the Society for Rescue of Aged Persons. And what we're going to talk about tonight are unprecedented biomedical endeavors that may revolutionize the concept of finite human lifespans. The topic of this presentation is human age reversal. Now what terrifies me more than anything else is that we may have already discovered the pieces needed to radically extend our healthy lifespans. But unless we amalgamate the pieces into a cohesive age reversal protocol, we may die just before science gains total control over pathological aging. Our mission, therefore, is to systematically develop protocols utilizing existing technologies so that we can start rejuvenating elderly people very, very soon. Now, the incredible news is the media has picked up on the science. It's no longer a no-no word to say immortality or people may start to live for indefinite periods of time. You're looking right now at the cover of Town and Country Magazine. The May 2017 issue talks about are rich people enough, are they rich enough to live forever? They're talking about the current high price of immortality. And bear in mind, that word immortality up until the last year or two was never spoken because no one ever thought it could ever happen. And we still don't know if it's going to happen, but the fact that the science and the media and a number of other popular people are talking about it, it means that maybe we're on the right trail. We're on the right trail for a lot of reasons. Now, the writer who put together the town and country article, he started it with, with a skeptical view, as most writers do. But as he started to interact with the scientists and some of the wealthy people who are putting money into the science, he started to come to the conclusion that maybe he should start taking better care of himself. So he, I have some quotes here of, uh, in the conclusion of his article where he starts saying, based on all this research into extending healthy longevity, well, he's increasing his blueberry consumption. He's improving his exercise uh, techniques, and he's doing what he can to be around because he says, after all, as you can read at the bottom of the screen, after all, I may be only one insanely successful startup away from immortality. The word has now gained a point of being publicly accepted. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Washington Post, April 14th, 2017. And I want you to look at the dates here, by the way, of these publication headlines I'm going to show you, because most of them are in 2017. Just over the last four to five months, there's been a virtual explosion of interest in the area of extending healthy human lifespans by virtue of reversing pathological aging processes. We know that when young blood is given to old animals, the old animals grow biologically younger. And the Washington Post is reporting that maybe it's time to start testing this out on people. And as longtime readers of our magazine and our, our other support groups know, we've been uh, advocates for human parabiosis research now for the last couple of years because we think it may very well enable older people to grow biologically younger. Now I'm going to review a concept that some of you are familiar with. Uh, it deals with senolytic compounds. Seno refer refers to senescent cells. Lytics refers to destruction. So a senolytic compound selectively destroys senescent cells. And these are cells that accumulate in our body that we want to get rid of because they create all kind of metabolic havoc. If you're looking at screen now, there's just four areas I've listed, listed that happen when you accumulate too many senescent cells. They impede organ function. They create systemic low-level inflammation. They increase cancer risk, and they shorten healthy lifespan. These senescent cells linger in our body and create metabolic havoc. There is no value in retaining these dysfunctional senile cells. 
we want to purge them from our aging body. And in doing so, we may get some incredible benefits. A 2015 rodent study used a drug that's available right now on a short-term basis to remove the senescent cells from the older rodents. And what they saw was frailty symptoms alleviated, arterial and cardiac function improving, improvements in bone density, exercise endurance increasing, the elimination of fat cell progenitors, and the extension of healthy lifespan. I don't think anyone viewing this right now would want to not have a senolytic compound in their body because the benefits could be outrageous. And some preliminary data on some human studies indicate that the removal of these, sen uh, these senescent cells from one's body, the removal of these senile dysfunctional cells may be inducing a rather rapid reversal in pathological aging processes. And these are some comments right now from the researchers who did the rodent study where they were able to observe the dramatic reversals of aging in rodents given a short course of the dacitinab drug. That drug is approved by the FDA, by the way, to treat leukemia, but it may have a side benefit when used over a very short course of time. Maybe only a three-week dosing of one tablet a week may induce enough senolytic activity to purge senescent cells from aging human bodies. We're very excited about this area of research, and you're gonna see more about that in the presentation I'm doing right now. Now, March 23rd, 2017, we learned about some researchers in the Netherlands who were doing research in the area of a peptide that has senolytic properties. And the idea of using a peptide, something composed of two or more amino acids that has a biological effect in place of the leukemia drug, well, that's very enticing. And they now want to see human trials using their senolytic peptide to see if they can't reverse aging in people by selectively seeking out and destroying the senescent cells that exist in the bodies of these older individuals. Now, another study coming out January 2017, they looked at an antibody that can block the effects of senescent plasma. As we get older, the plasma in our body unfortunately loses its youthful characteristics. As a result, we get older, we become sick with all kinds of illnesses that may be reversible if we can simply restore youthful plasma into our body. But a more effective way would be to identify the specific protein and old plasma that causes degenerative illness and block it. And these researchers have developed a peptide that they believe can do that. And they're looking forward to doing a human study at Stanford and at some other locations. So we're real excited about this because this may obliviate the need for the leukemia drug if we can use a peptide to get rid of these senescent cells that are lingering in our body far longer than they should. Now our bone marrow, that's where our hematopoietic stem cells are produced and released where they are able to convert to all kinds of other cells to systemically keep us younger. As we grow older, so does our bone marrow. And as a result, we don't produce as many stem cells as we used to to repair or regenerate our aging organs. So these researchers believe they have developed a method that will improve the bone marrow niche and enable many more stem cells to be produced, thereby reducing the risk of blood cancers and also having regenerative effects in aging humans. So, so far what we've looked at are two technologies, one to get rid of the senescent cells and this particular technology to boost hematic, hematopoietic stem cell production so that we can then regenerate our aging organs. These are very exciting developments. And again, look at the date, March 2nd, 2017. This research is coming around right before our eyes. And again, the media is picking up on it. Harvard Gazette, March 23rd, 2017. They're looking at a method to repair DNA. This is absolutely critical because every second that we're alive, we're enduring tremendous amounts of DNA damage. And the only reason we don't die real soon is that we efficiently repair the damage inflicted to our DNA. Well, these researchers are validating right now a method that we could use uh, to regenerate ourselves via the repair of our broken DNA. 
and a lot of exciting reports we believe are going to come out of Harvard this year relating to DNA repair mechanisms that will be made available to virtually everybody. This in of itself, that's all we could do to reverse aging, would be a major step forward. But if you put together the removal of our senescent cells via the use of a senolytic compound, restoring our bone marrow so that it produces more hematopoietic stem cells, and then we start repairing DNA, we're going to make older people a heck of a lot healthier and probably make them live a lot longer. The Salk Institute reported in December 2016 another technology to reverse aging. What they're doing is using a gene to reverse aging in mice, and it works by a very unique way. It enables cells in the skin to convert into pluripotent stem cells. And by this method, you might not even need your bone marrow restored. You could take virtually any cell in your body, convert it to a pluripotent stem cell, and then regenerate systemically your aging tissues and organs. This could be a major, major breakthrough. And there was a lot of media reports about this because when they gave this gene therapy to the, to the mice, well, they saw some interesting effects. Uh, they looked younger. And I know for some people, that's all they care about. They, they want to look younger. But what happened here is the mice lived 30% longer. Their healing rates improved faster when injured. So we've got something come out of the Salk Institute right now, a gene therapy that may work via still a different mechanism to rejuvenate older people. This is starting to add up to a major, major advance in the extension of healthy lifespan. This was the lead author of that Salk study talking about how they were able to show that aging might be reversed. Now bear in mind, up until year 2014, 2015, nobody was talking about this. This was something that was buried in medical journals, but the media was not reporting on it, and people weren't talking much about it. Well, guess what? 2016, 2017 came along, and we're seeing studies in mainstream publications talking about age reversal. The New Yorker, April 3rd, 2017, talked about the Silicon Valley people, the multi-billionaires of Silicon Valley who have achieved what would be considered impossible technological successes with IT and communications technology, well, they're now looking at aging as just another engineering challenge. They plan to re-engineer our bodies so that we live a lot longer. In fact, those young billionaires, they don't want to die, and they're putting their money into it in a major way. The Atlantic did a review article about what these billionaires are doing. Again, look at these dates. February 18th, 2017, the Atlantic did an article entitled, Should We Die? I don't know why that question would ever be asked, but they're talking about radical longevity being right around the corner, and they're questioning whether or not that's a desirable event. I don't think anyone has called questions that. We would like to have the uh, longevity, the radical life extension where we have healthy lifespans that go on for decades, if not centuries. We pretty much know about Google and their subsidiary Calico. They have a goal, according to the Atlantic, of curing death. We like that. We appreciate that work they're doing. There's some other work being done up in the uh, Northern California area where they're using apheresis to remove senescent plasma from older people with the objective of rejuvenating them. And as they remove the senescent plasma, they replace it with the uh, fluids and other protein constituents that would be in healthy young plasma. So we're really anxious to hear what kind of results they're getting, but from, from what we understand, that trial may be starting any time now. A drug called rapamycin, I'm gonna talk more about that during this presentation, that's extended the lives of mice when given in mid-age. Uh, rapamycin works via a mechanism known as autophagy, that is ridding the cells of toxic debris that occur over time. And we've got some scientists right now who are using low-dose rapamycin in an attempt to extend their own lifespans by removing the cellular pollutants that occur as we go through aging and we lose our natural uh, ability to remove these toxic waste projects products. So again, the media picking up on whether or not the Billionaires putting all this money into research are going to succeed, and many of the media sources are saying, yeah, they're probably going to succeed because they've done everything else. They've been able to disrupt everything we do in life. You look at your smartphone or look at your, your home computer, and you can see what, what has happened. And now these same people who have accomplished the impossible 
they're determined to solve the ultimate problem, aging and death. They don't like it. They want to see it go away. And we're very happy to see these people putting their money and their ingenuity into figuring out a way to make us young. Now, the business world is not ignoring all this. Uh, Goldman Sachs, April 5th, 2017, published a report talking about all the money that's pouring into a hot new area of science that could radically change the way we think about aging. Venture capital investors are putting money into regenerative medicine. Again, it's another term for age reversal research, which is what we're seeking to do. And according to the Goldman Sachs report, in, 19, uh, in 2011, $296 million went into these regenerative medicine projects. Well, that more than doubled by 2016. And they see regenerative medicine as one of the most compelling areas for venture investment. So we're seeing mainstream people viewing regenerative medicine or age reversal as a way to make a lot of money. This chart published by Goldman Sachs shows where uh, the money was spent in 2010 on regenerative medicine. You can see how the amount has surged as of 2016. So money is going in, the media is reporting on it, scientific developments are occurring, we're on the verge of a biomedical revolution. Forbes magazine, again, April 14, 2017, I was putting these slides together and I had to keep redoing them because the information kept coming in about new people, new credible sources talking about the fact that age reversal is now going mainstream. And if you wonder why or where this all emanated from, uh, I'd like to say it emanated from life extension and all the work we've been doing for the past 40 years, but in reality, back in 2011, Journal of American Medical Association published a review titled Age Reversal. This was in JAMA. This is a, a quoted uh, and, and prestigious medical journal, and they were talking about age reversal back in 2011. And you go forward to 2016, Science Daily talking about the rapamycin. Again, a potential way to enable older people to rid their cells of the toxic debris that accumulates because the, the autophagy, unfortunately, it diminishes with aging, but there are ways to restore it and the drug rapamycin used in the low dose may very well do that. And I'm hoping to have a scientist over the next several months come on this program and talk about what effects they've been able to observe in humans who are self-experimenting with low dose rapamycin with the objective of getting rid of the cellular debris that clogs up our delicate internal cellular machinery as we grow older and causes us to prematurely die. This, this study published in 2015 talked about reversing certain aspects of liver aging uh, through activating telomerase, regulating DNA methylation better. Uh, so the, the data has been coming in that aging does not go in one direction it is possible to reverse many aspects of aging, including the involution of the thymus gland. That's the master gland of immunity, and as we grow older, our thymus gland shrinks. Well, there was validation done in a proof of concept study where they were able to restore both thymic structure and thymic function. Those findings were reported at the Revolution Against Aging and Death Conference in August 2016. And they actually showed an MRI image of a, of a baseline uh, thymus gland, which was virtually not there in a 68-year-old man. And after a year of this therapy, it had restored itself to a youthful shape. And the immune tests that they're doing are indicating that those restored thymus glands are functioning in a way that's improving the immune status of older people. And that will be a, still another topic of a future webinar that we'll do where those scientists will talk about their research and what results they're getting in reversing thymic atrophy. This would be a fantastic way of reversing immune senescence, which is the underlying reason why most people die in this country right now. And Harvard, again, uh, back in 2010, talked about age reversal, using their own methods, using genetics to potentially make older people grow biologically younger. Now, this is all fantastic news. Our time has come. We've been fighting for over 40 years to get people to recognize aging as the most important problem facing humanity. So the idea has taken hold. Nothing's gonna stop it, but a real big but, and this is the next slide I'm gonna show you. It's a little dense, but what I'm gonna just describe as an overview is we, the people on this webinar call, need to participate in our own 
regeneration. Our own age reversal, if we're gonna enjoy it, may very well depend on the actions that people listening to this webinar take because we've got limiting factors. Unfortunately, the, the billionaires pouring all this money into research, most of them are under age 55. They lack the sense of urgency that most of us have. I'm 62 years old, by the way, and I have a tremendous sense of urgency to do something about that. And many of our listeners are older than I am. They have a greater sense of urgency. And we've got the government in our way. We've got academia. We've got big pharma. We've got a lot of people in our way, but we're going to break down those barriers. And that's the reason why we formed this society for the rescue of aged persons. We're determined to keep our elderly members alive via a number of different options that I'm gonna describe near the end of this presentation. So we need to do something beyond what everyone else is doing. The great news is other people are funding research, scientists are conducting the research, the media is reporting on the research, great news, but we need to make it available to us right now in many cases. Some people listening to this, unfortunately, may only have a couple years to live. They need to have their aging process reversed. We are committed, at least I'm committed, to making that happen in every way I can. Now the great news is, we already know about many pathological mechanisms of aging. We already know about telomere attrition, inflammation, endothelial dysfunction. We know how to circumvent most of what you're looking at on the screen. We know how to do it right now, which is fantastic, but there's more to aging than everything else you're looking at right now. A little bit more to aging. And one of them has to do with a protein contained in young blood that kind of disappears when we grow older. The name of that protein is GDF11. That stands for Growth Differentiating Factor 11. And it's present in young people, and it does all kind of wonderful things, but as we grow older, well, it disappears. And as a result, we suffer the multiple comorbidities and premature deanimations that occur because we don't have enough GDF11. Now, in the, in the mouse model, when they take GDF11 and put it into older mice, the older mice have partial age reversal. And, and the more research that they do, they see it has a more systemic age reversal property. Now, what I'm gonna do now is introduce an individual who has been self-experimenting with GDF11 uh, for the last two and a half years. And he's got some incredible news to report on a group of people who are using GDF11 in themselves right now. I'm patient zero on G GDF11. I started GDF11 injections nearly three years ago on June 14th, 2014. Just some background on GDF11, it's the largest cytokine in the human body. It's a huge molecule, uh, weighs in at over 42,000 Daltons. Hence, it must be injected. There's no uh, GDF11 pill or secreting, uh, at least not yet. And I'd like to, to start with why I chose GDF11 as my anti-aging uh, therapy. Uh, in 2014, the Harvard Stem Cell Institute published a paper describing GDF11. It sounded too good, good to be true. In the, the beginning of the paper, they, they discussed parabiosis. In fact, this is a graphic from the paper, which, uh, which is shown here, as a proven method of de-aging an old mouse when it's hooked up to a young mouse. Now, you know, when you're trying to cure aging, there's many paths you can go down. You know, there's a telomere path, there's a mitochondrial path, there's, a, a, you know, probably 20 others. But this is something we've known about, you know, for 50 years. 50 years we've known you take an old mouse and a young mouse, you hook them together, the uh, old mouse is going to de-age. And as Bill said, you see greater blood flow, uh, enhanced olfaction, all kinds of good stuff. But there's one big problem. There, there's over 100,000, that's one-tenth of a million, 100,000 substances in the blood. So, okay, yeah, we, we knew this back in the 70s. But what the hell is, is uh, you know, the substance or substances that's uh, reversing aging? So to me, this was the ultimate, you know, needle in a haystack exercise. I mean, finding uh, finding GF11 is is, uh, is incredibly difficult, and only with the, uh, the advanced technology we have nowadays, you know, rapid screening and uh, uh, supercomputers, we're uh, you know they're able to do this. And I believe that the uh, Harvard stem cell team will probably uh, win a uh, Nobel Prize for this. Uh, 
within the next 10 years. An incredible achievement. If any of them are listening to this, thank you. Okay, next slide. So I just want to talk about why I decided to become patient zero on GDF11. GDF11 mimics parabiosis and was shown to improve uh, three key systems in uh, mice, cardiac, neural, and muscular, which makes it very compelling. But there's a, uh, you know, we have a cohort of about 50 people and people can talk, mice can't talk. So we've learned a lot more. Any system in the body that has uh, stem cells uh, involved, including hearing, uh, eyesight, skin, kidney, uh, liver, are improved by uh, GDF-11. Uh, GDF-11 is, is endogenous, which makes it inherently safer than any man-made substance. It's de definitely not going to poison the body. The body knows what it is. You all have GDF-11 in you. You just don't have enough. Unless we get some 18-year-olds uh, that are... Uh, that are tuned in. So, and, and this is what makes a lot of uh, blockbuster bug drugs very dangerous, you know, like uh, Fosamax or Lipitor. These are not endogenous substances and they have a lot of uh, bad side effects. And even the most dangerous endogenous hormones, uh, insulin and thyroid, are not lethal in uh, nano quantities. And that's what we've been doing with GDF11. We take tiny, tiny amounts. You're talking about, uh, you know, but I take. 0.5 nanograms every other day. That's half of a billionth of a gram. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, it's incredibly tiny amounts, but there aren't that many stem cells. The circulating levels of GDF-11 are very low, and that's, that's why uh, you don't need a whole lot. Okay, uh, next slide. This is very interesting. The molecular structure of GDF-11 is conserved across all vertebrate species. So uh, if you order, a, even though you're not a rat, if you order a rat GDF-11 from a lab, it'll work just fine. It's the same exact molecular structure. You know, so it's rat, GDF-11, cat, uh, orangutan, elephant, chimp, all exactly the same. It just shows how important it is to life and uh, you know how early uh, it showed up in evolution. And it's a molecular structure that, that can't be toyed with. In fact, uh, GF11 knockout mice are never born. I mean, usually if you knock out some key hormone or peptide, uh, the, the mouse is born with you know, some kind of uh, defect. But uh, GF11 knockout mice are never are never born. So it is important, very important in embryogenesis. Uh, organs transplanted from uh, older to younger people uh, actually do very well. I researched this before I took it. Uh, I figure we're, we're going to assume for this talk that GF11 levels uh, do go down with age. That's, that's a big controversy about that, but I have a lot of data suggesting that they do go down with age. And uh, if GF11 were toxic, you took an old, an old kidney, 80 year old kidney, put it in a 20 year old, he would wither and die. That's not the case. It's actually the opposite. The uh, old kidney does pretty well in the uh, in the 20 year old. You can you can look this up. Anyway, the reason that we're all you're talking about risk here. Uh, the reason we're all uh, tuned in because we know that letting aging take its course is is, is incredibly risky. Uh, the cost of doing nothing is very high. I, I mean, I'm, I'm 59. In 21 years, I'm uh, statistically uh, dead. So to me, uh, there was a really a no-brainer to give nanogram quantities of uh, GDF11 a try. And of course, I I believe that nothing. Nothing great on this planet has ever happened without someone taking a big risk. And that's just the way it is and the way it always will be. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, the mechanism of action of uh, GDF-11 are quite interesting. Um, it's basically a uh, repair stem cell DNA. Your stem cells, uh, to use the molecular biology term, incur a lot of insult, uh, DNA damage in replication. Uh, hematic, Bill was talking about hematopoietic cells. The hematopoietic cells, these are, these are very busy cells. They make all your blood cells, uh, and they typically, uh, one hematopoietic cell makes between 60 and 80,000 blood cells, T cells, B cells, neutrophils, red blood cells in a day. That's, you know, about a little less than one a second. And uh, they, they, uh, they see a lot of DNA damage from this, and eventually the cell uh, becomes senescent, which means uh, it doesn't do anything. It just sits there. Uh, as Bill was saying, arguably causes uh, damage. Anyway, GF11 repairs the DNA and damage and restores a uh, function to the stem cell, brings it back online. Uh, 
but uh, there's probably the reason that I'm not 21 is that uh, a lot of these uh, senescent cells eventually die off. So my stem cell colonies are, are smaller than a 21-year-old, uh, but at least I've been able to restore uh, some of them. Anyway, GF11 is also thought to move progenitor cells into an active state in the senses, in the eye, uh, olfaction, and ears. It moves the progenitor cells into an active state. On the right is a graph from the Harvard Stem Cell um, Institute paper. You can see on the left we have a, uh, uh, a mouse, the leftmost one, young mouse. The green is no DNA damage. Orange is some, red is a lot. And you, you give the young mouse GDF11, uh, you don't see a whole lot happening. You have to hit control plus a few times. You're a good nerd to see, to see the difference. I guess the orange shrunk a little bit. But uh, you move over to the uh, old mouse, the third bar, with no GDF11. This is just, you know, old mouse. Uh, they do uh, electro. Uh, <laughs> Um, there we go. And the uh, slideshow from the current slide. Well, I guess we can do this. Anyway, so you see, uh, there we go. Okay. So uh, you see the old mouse not looking too good. You got a lot of red, a lot of DNA damage. And uh, you give this guy GDF11, and look, he is green. He's green. He's uh, almost as good as a young guy. Or, and uh, so it, it helps them a lot. And I've seen this in my cohort. If you give a young person GDF11, you know, I mean, young is 40 and under to me, uh, you don't see, uh, they don't really go on. They say, oh, yeah, I got some energy, skin looks a little better. They don't, they don't go on and on because their, their stem cells are in reasonably good shape. You give it to an older guy like me, you know, people 50 and over really affuse about it. So, uh, You'll see this graph really uh, it reflects what's happened with my uh, cohort. Okay, and next slide. Just some anecdotal feedback. Um, you see a lot of increased stamina from uh, GF11. It's the first thing I noticed, and a lot of people noticed. Is the first thing they said, oh, I don't get wind to climbing stairs anymore. I'm, I'm very into biking and backpacking. I like to put 50 pounds of uh, tent and food on my back and head to the woods. And about five years ago, I noticed I was sitting down all the time. Never found a rock or a log I didn't like. And uh, <laughs> now after taking, taking GF11, I could power through. I could do a four or five mile hike up to the top of the mountain or wherever we're camping out, uh, no problem. Um, improved skin elasticity. Uh, we have biomarkers on this, but it's also noticeable in the mirror, especially uh, in your 50s and 60s. Uh, greater, greater mental clarity. Uh, improve reaction time and more eloquent. I can type faster. I feel like I write better. A lot of people say that. But we'll talk about reaction time in a minute. Gray hair reversal, I'd say about half the cohort sees this. Uh, usually, some people say it grows back uh, in patches. Some say it starts to turn, turn black, but that's, uh, that's pretty good. Supposedly, I don't think there are any um, regimens that could do this. Improve sexual performance. The cohort is entirely male, so you know what this means. I won't get into the details. Okay, next is uh, better sleep, vivid dreams, and circadian rhythms and force. That means uh, you go to bed at uh, midnight, uh, you'll get up at eight, and you, you'll have everybody, almost everybody reports really vivid dreams. If you can record, and they make sense. If you record them, they'd be, they'd be blockbusters. One of the first things you notice, you, get, you sleep very deeply, but if you take too much GD of 11, you'll wake up uh, early, which I, which I don't like. I like my eight hours, but if you take too much, I'll wake up at, uh, you know, at six hours or five hours. If you take way too much, you won't sleep at all. So the insomnia is like the first side effect. Uh, greatly increased appetite. Uh, this is, this is uh, generally a good thing. Uh, most people on GDF11 lose weight, so it's hard to say if it's from the GDF11 or it's the size of doing something radical, time for a lifestyle change. For me, uh, just means uh, eating out more. Check it out, all, all the, the fine New York restaurants in the neighborhood. Improved sense of smell, this is really key. Um, olfaction is, is uh, tied uh, to neurogenesis. Uh, Alzheimer's patients can't smell, and it's actually there's a test for Alzheimer's, it's a test for Alzheimer's, peanut butter test. 
So uh, the sense of smell is, is very, very key. And a lot of people re report, including myself, uh, big, big increase in sense of smell. I actually had to change a few things in my apartment. I had three cats in carpeting. Not a good combination. actually had to uh, get rid of the carpeting and put in a, a fan and a, and a litter box and do all kinds of stuff. And now I can, now I can walk in. A couple of years ago, it was, it was rough. So uh, I'm sure everybody's happy to hear about that. Okay, uh, increased sweat production. This is a good thing. Uh, sweat production is uh, correlated with age. It goes down. And uh, those of you who are into aerobic exercise know that sweating is good. Keep your core temperature low. And uh, you, you take GDF 11, you'll notice within a couple of weeks, you're, uh, you'll sweat a lot more when you uh, work on this. This is a good thing. Okay, uh, some testimonials. This guy's a tennis player. He had a problem with his uh, left knee and three orthopedists, or two orthopedists out of three said he needed a uh, replacement, although maybe just they needed Mercedes payments. I thought that was pretty funny. But anyway, nobody bought a car. And this guy, he, uh, his knee is fine now. He credits GF11 uh, for contributing to the uh, cure. He's able to run normally, do drop shots. Uh, he's told me recently he's playing, you know, 20 uh, yeah, people 25 years younger than him. That's, that's pretty good. So uh, doesn't want to, he shouldn't play me. I would ruin his game. But anyway, he's a 79, doing well. Okay, uh, next slide. This guy has cardiac uh, hypertrophy. He gets winded very, very easily. But he's, he's happy that he can now walk to the ATM uh, without uh, having to catch his breath. Uh, his uh, heart recovers uh, to rest very much faster. He also doesn't have a regular heartbeat. He says, I've met a lot of uh, heart patients, but I'd like to try this. He's 81. And uh, next slide. Uh, this guy, uh, I actually know he's, he's my uh, contractor for my apartment here in New York. Uh, it's a story near and dear to my heart, and uh, it's probably my biggest accomplishment with GF11 since uh, you know, everybody wants to look better when you, you look in the mirror. This guy couldn't see anything in the mirror. I mean, his macular degeneration had gotten so bad that he's it become very depressed and said, uh, I can't work if it gets any worse. And uh, so I started him on GF11 on March 8th. After three weeks, he can now read the numerals on, on his alarm clock, which is a you know, he huge leap forward. My right hand, eye has gotten better. I think there's mild improvement to the left. And we do have biomarkers on, on this guy. Um, I have right, right in front of me. And these biomarkers have a whole different vernacular. You know, there's a focal RP, atrophy, uh, drusen, and there's a um, a whole bunch of um, uh, laser uh, tracking laser tomography. So we have baselines from a couple of months ago, and in about a month, uh, is going to go in again. And we'll put them next to each other and uh, see if there's improvement. I think I think the worst case is it's not going to get any worse, and that's uh, it's a pretty uh, pretty big accomplishment. Anyway, this is this is great to hear, but at the end of the day, what really counts in measuring the efficacy of SGDF11 is biomarkers. And uh, I'd just like to say that uh, I hopefully, uh, uh, even if you don't believe in GF11, I'd like to see a new standard in the anti-aging world. Someone says they have a regimen that works. Don't say, show me the money. You say, show me the biomarkers. Because, you know, there's a hell of a lot of placebo effect with anti-aging. And I actually, I mean, I've been working on this 25 years. I, I started growth hormone right after the Rudman paper came out in 91. And uh, I'll tell you, the more you pay for someone and the more hassle, the more you pay for a regimen, the more hassle it is, the more you're going to say, oh, man, I'm skiing great, I'm running great. But hey, at the end of the day, we need hard data. That's, that's all the cuts. And I've got some hard data for you. By RadFest, I'll have probably five times as much as this. But right now, we have uh, three sets of biomarkers. Um, you can see, here's me, patient zero, uh, age 58 when this was done. And all my work, all my work with uh, growth hormone, testosterone, DHEA, <laughs> my skin age was basically the same as my own age. Go figure. Okay, well, uh, I'm sure we could discuss that for quite a long time. But anyway, after 14 months on GDF11, my uh, skin age uh, is uh, 40.5, which that's pretty good. 
Uh, by the way, that's a pitometer in the upper right hand corner. If you wonder what it looks like, it actually uh, pulls on your skin, just just like you you could do a simple skin elasticity test on the back of your hand, pull out your skin, and see how long it takes to retract. It, it works the same principle. Um, by the way, I went saw the cutometer about two months ago, and I was down age thirty four. We'll see if I can stay there. But uh, if you could, if I another thing with the biomarkers, if all these are the same in five years. It's a huge accomplishment. Running in place with anti-aging is, is a huge accomplishment. So we'll see. We just keep taking these, fill them with a big database full of biomarkers, and we're going to see where we get out. Okay, uh, patient one, age 52. Yeah, this guy, he went from, uh, he, he did well. Went from 49, age 34, 30% 30 improvement. Um, and now the bottom patient, age. now this guy's 40. As I said, remember the, the uh, DNA damage graph. Not as profound in the young mouse. This guy's a young mouse. He's only 40, 41. He went down to 37. So only, a, you know, 9% improvement. That's still not bad. Better than going the other direction, right? Okay, uh, next slide. Cognitive biomarkers. Um, this is, if you guys, this is, uh, someone says they can improve cognition. You say, show me the CNS vital science report. This is the gold standard of cognition. It's, 20, you can go to their site and you can download it. It's 25 bucks. It's the most annoying test in the world. You have to memorize words. You have to match color, match shape, don't match color, don't match shape. You have to do simple digit processing, which is like, uh, yeah, it's like looking at this Rosetta Stone. A squiggle is one, and a triangle is two, and you got to bang in the numbers as fast as you can. You can uh, they actually time you on the test, too. And uh, below 20 minutes, you said I did it 19 and a half. And that's pretty good. So, anyway. What's most correlated with age are two things, reaction time and symbol digit processing. And I don't care how many times you take this test and what you're doing, you cannot improve reaction time. You can't practice re re improve reaction time. It declines linearly with age, unfortunately. Um, you can see me, I was pretty bad, fifth percentile. Don't, don't get in the car with me. Plus I'm a New Yorker, so I never drive. There's two reasons not to drive with me, but anyway, I, I uh, improved quite a bit, went from fifth to 37th percentile. Still not great, but <laughs> certainly better than where I was. Patient two, also a New Yorker, went from fourth to 81st. And patient three, uh, the, the young pup, 40 year old. Hey, yeah, of course, he's, he, he's looking a lot better than, than us old guys. He was at the 47th percentile, and he banged it up to uh, 66, but not as dramatic improvement. And also, you just look at the uh, my memory and visual and verbal memory have improved on um, GF11, uh, though these are not necessarily great biomarkers of aging. Uh, a lot of people in their 80s have phenomenal uh, memory. So just remember, CNS vital signs, reaction time, similar to processing. Whatever regimen you're doing, if you can improve these, you're, you're doing well. Okay, uh, next one. Arterial stiffness. This, that's a Figmo core machine in the right. That's a very sophisticated uh, you know, blood pressure and heart analysis. It does your um, central blood pressure, which is a lot better than your cup of blood pressure. It also measures something known as augmentation pressure. This is uh, on the, the reflected wave from the systole. It, uh, it, it very highly correlated. Augmentation pressure very highly correlated with hardening of the arteries. Something, unfortunately, we all have to deal with. Now, this is something you can improve. You know, with diet, you start running marathons, you can improve your arterial elasticity, but ultimately, uh, it will catch up with you. Anyway, in the uh, three patients, we saw an average of 37% improvement. That's, that's pretty good. That's without doing the marathons. Okay. My last slide. Uh, this is a quote from the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. GDF-11 is naturally found in much higher concentrations than younger mice and older ones, and, and uh, raising its level in older mice has improved function of every organ system studied so far. Once I said it, an organ is made by stem cells, or supported by stem cells, uh, we see a lot of improvement. Now, this is a controversial statement. For every paper that you read, this, this says GDF-11 goes down with age, there's another paper that goes up with age. This is because 90% of your GDF-11 is stored in your platelets. Measuring serum is not going to work. We have to isolate the platelet, platelets, freeze them, and lysate them, and, and measure the uh, GDF-11 highway. Also, it's even complicated. 
there's three problems. There's that, that mostly in the playlist, it's in tiny, tiny quantities in the human body. And uh, the third is that there, there uh, is another uh, cytokine called uh, GDF8, which is myostatin, which is 90% homodulous to uh, GDF11. And uh, I've taken these ELISA GDF11 tests. They don't work well. You're measuring mostly myostatin. And myostatin goes up with age. So a lot of people say, hey, this is going up with age. But uh, I have the dosing data. I have a lot of stuff. I won't say proofs. This molecular biology don't say proof, but I have a lot of data that suggests a younger person needs far less GF11 than an older person. Happy to share that with, with people. Okay, I've rambled on long enough. Thank you. And uh, back to Bill. Okay, Steve Perry. Fantastic presentation. Now, when we promoted the idea of doing a clinical study on GDF11, and the reason we were so excited about it is that in young blood, there's a lot of GDF11. And when people get older, well, it diminishes. So the idea of being able to take an isolated protein that is widely available in young blood and put that isolated protein into older people, it intrigued many of our Life Extension Magazine readers to the extent that they were inundating us with phone calls saying, how can I get it? Well, what we're hoping to do very soon is initiate a self-funded clinical trial where people will be able to access GDF11 to see if they can attain the same benefits that were demonstrated by Steve Perry's cohort of GDF11 users over the last two plus years. And what will be required for that study will be for people to go in and get baseline measurements because we wanna know how well it's really working. We just don't want good anecdotal feedback. It's nice to hear, but we want to see the clinical biomarkers. We want to ensure ourselves that GDF is doing at the molecular level and at levels that it can be easily measured the same way that people are feeling. And again, this Washington Post article talking about the tantalizing possibility of giving young plasma to older people, well, that's a more sophisticated study. We're going to discuss that in a few minutes. But GDF11 is essentially a shortcut. It's available now for people who want to enter into a clinical study, and we would test them at baseline probably two or three months out and then 12 months out. We want to make sure that GDF11 is inducing a meaningful and systemic age reversal benefit. We're going to talk about how to enroll in that study uh, towards the end of this presentation. So to reintroduce people to the concept of para Biosis, these, this research was started over 50 years ago, where they would suture a young mouse onto an older mouse, and the older mouse would grow biologically younger. This was very consistent. Many, many studies were done showing the incredible benefits of young circulating blood into an older animal. Now, we can't do that with people. As much as I'd like to suture a healthy 18-year-old to my body and enjoy the healthy circulating blood, that doesn't work in human beings. It works in rodents, not in humans. What we will do instead of this, which is not practical for all kinds of reasons, we want to take stem cell mobilized young plasma and infuse it once a month into elderly people to see if we cannot emulate the parabiosis data in which older animals grew biologically younger in response to the continuous flow of young blood. What we're going to do by mobilizing the bone marrow of younger people, we're gonna produce a stem cell plasma concentrate minus the stem cells. We don't wanna put stem cells of young people into older people. What we wanna put into those older people is the young plasma that contains about 700 proteins, including GDF11, hormones, exosomes, all kind of beneficial factors in young people. We want to infuse that into an older person, just like it's shown on this mouse study. And what we're expecting to see, well, some of the benefits have been reported about parabiosis, where when they splice the old animal into the younger one, they're able to see systemic rejuvenation. The research is so, is so impressive that back in 2015, they said, we need to start testing this out in human beings. We've seen it consistently work in the animal model. Let's see if it can rejuvenate the heart, brain, muscle, and almost every other tissue of young humans 
or all humans with the young blood, just like it's doing with the young mice. Because the young plasma, young blood from young animals, when given to the older animals, it seems to breed new life into their organs, making the older animals appear smarter and healthier, and also makes them live longer. And just one of the benefits of young plasma is it rejuvenates our endothelial lining. It improves our arterial function so that we can enable better circulation throughout our entire body, primarily in the brain. And many of us are very vulnerable to stroke. Even though we're taking care of ourselves, stroke is still a huge problem. Well, if we are able to give monthly infusions of stem cell mobilized plasma and improve blood flow, improve the health of our endothelial lining, and then generate neural stem cells, we may be able to grow biologically younger in the most important organ of our body, which is our brain. Now, this is a, the, some comments uh, made uh, in response to this study in 2015 from some very prestigious researchers at Stanford and Harvard. They're talking about reversing aging in the animal model, and it's now time to really start doing this in human beings because the data is so consistent that young blood restores youthful functionality to older animals, it's time to start taking elderly people and give them stem cell mobilized young plasma with the objective of reversing biological aging. Now this is one of the most important slides you're gonna to see tonight. This is out of the journal Nature, published in January 2015. But look at this chart at the bottom left-hand side of the screen. It charts the number of studies that were done starting around the 1950s. It, it shows them going continuously up. If you can see my pointer showing from 1950, actually before then, doing the parabiosis research on animals, it's a steady line up, and it peaked right around 1970, went down a little bit, went back up again, and then it fell off a cliff, fell off a cliff, this incredible research in which old animals were rejuvenated, it fell off a cliff. Now, we don't know the exact reasons for it. It could have been the scientists who did a lot of this research, they may have grown old and died themselves, or they may have run out of funding, or a number of other factors could have come into play that caused all this great research from 1950 to 1970 to fall off a cliff. And why that is so relevant to tonight's conversation is we've got doctors in place with the medical facilities, the equipment, and the protocols, and INDs, investigational new drug applications, ready to file with the FDA, but all that's lacking right now is the funding. In other words, we could start making elderly people grow functionally younger and healthier right now if we can raise the money to make this happen. But this chart is probably the most important element of this presentation tonight, because this is not unusual in medicine for progress to move steadily forward and then fall off a cliff. It happens for a number of reasons. We can't let it happen now. There is too much positive data about the potential benefit of stem cell mobilized young plasma being infused on a monthly basis into older people. And to give you further evidence as to how effective this might be, November 2016, the media covered this very widely. Some researchers at Stanford, they, they did a little study where they took the blood from young teenagers and they injected it into old mice. And the old mice grew biologically younger. It was described as the fountain of youth. And then they said something like it's creepy, which I don't think anyone on this phone call think it's creepy. The fountain of youth is a good thing. Making old people young again has all kinds of benefits. So this is some of the data that was uh, observed when the blood from young teenagers, young human teenagers put into old mice, improved cognition, decreased inflammation, new brain cells forming, and the old animals acted young. Again, the title that the media throw it out is the fountain of youth is real, but creepy. Well, let's forget about this creepy part. The bottom line is fountain of youth is real, we need to start studying the effects of young plasma in older humans because young plasma from humans is making old rodents young. We need to start seeing that happen. And again, to emphasize from that study where they took young human plasma, put it into old rats, the old rats behaved younger. 
That's what's really amazing. The old rodents behave younger in response to this young blood. So we, these were mice, by the way, not rats, but the older mice in response to young blood being put into them, they behaved younger, they enjoyed systemic rejuvenation. We can't wait for pharmaceutical companies to make this happen. Johnson & Johnson spending $50 million with Stanford. They're gonna use young plasma in an attempt to treat Alzheimer's disease. We think that's fantastic that Johnson & Johnson is doing that, but it may take 10 years before it's ever available to us. We can't wait 10 years. We may reach a point where even if this technology works, we're too old to benefit from us, or we may not be around anymore to benefit. So we need to bypass the bureaucracy. We need to move this technology forward. And the good news is there are ways to do that. So the real bottom line to all of this, and it's substantiated in many, many published studies, is that young blood will rejuvenate old animals. And the effect is systemic, a systemic rejuvenation effect in response to young plasma transfer. And we've got protocols in place right now to do this research. We need to make it happen. So what we're looking for right now over a three-year period is $10 million, a lot of money. This is the most expensive study. I'm going to tell you about the GTF 11 one, which is very inexpensive. This one, unfortunately, is kind of a, a platinum study because it involves the transfer of all the young proteins, hormones, exosomes from stem cells into older people. And it may cost as much as $10 million, may come in for less, but we don't want to underfund this or any other study because when you start taking shortcuts, you miss data and you can get a false positive, a false negative. We don't want to do that. Now, what we're going to do if we raise this money is we're going to disperse it based on predefined milestones. In other words, no one's going to get $10 million that we raise. They have to get the young people recruited. We do have a number of young people recruited already by virtue of a contribution Life Extension Foundation made towards the stem cell research project. This was $800,000 that we put in for a pilot study to see if using young immune components were effective on advanced cancer patients. We were able to observe improved immunity against the tumor in response to the transfer of stem cell mobilized young uh, blood constituents into advanced cancer patients. So we've got some good preliminary data that in human beings, young blood constituents will have a rejuvenating effect. So the protocol for the age reversal clinical study that we've been talking about now for almost two years, we recruit young donors. They've got to be around age 21. We really don't want them older than that. And then we're going to use a drug that will mobilize their bone marrow to spew out huge quantities of functional stem cells, immune cells, and other youth proteins. The people will be on this drug for about five days. Then we're going to put them on a, an apheresis machine, and we're going to remove their plasma and their stem cells. And we're going to separate their plasma from the stem cells. We do not want to put young stem cells into an elderly person at this time. There's a side effect risk to that. So we're going to take out the stem cells of pain from the young people, and we will cryopreserve those because the young people can benefit enormously from their own stem cells as they grow older. And if they develop a hematological malignancy like leukemia, well, that could save their life. Because unfortunately, you develop leukemia, you're out there looking for a bone marrow donor, and even if you get what's known as a 10-10 match, which is the best there is, you still have a 40 to 50% chance, unfortunately, of succumbing to graft versus host disease. So old people at this point should not put young people's stem cells into their bodies. However, the plasma from young people could be enormously beneficial. And we're talking about stem cell mobilized plasma. And the virtue of that is the stem cells secrete out into the plasma exosome factors that are extremely beneficial. And then there's these about 700 proteins and, and hormones that young people have in their bodies that we want to transfer to elderly people through monthly infusions. And this process will take one year as far as the treatment. And then we're going to very carefully observe what type of age reversal benefits are these elderly individuals going to attain. So the cost of the study may be about $10 million. It's going to take about three years to do it. But during that three-year period, we may be taking older people who have a number of different health issues 
and enabling to grow biologically younger. So that's the study that we're hoping to raise funding for through a number of means, by the way. And if that study works, there will be a stampede of older people seeking out this age reversal therapy. So as I started this presentation, right now, uh, we've got an idea that's taking hold. The concept of aging has been radically reversed. People no longer think it only goes in one direction. They now understand it is a reversible phenomenon, and the only factor that's going to limit us is both funding and can we live long enough to enjoy it. The media is picking up on what we're doing. They are acknowledging that technology may emerge to enable human beings to live forever. Immortality is now a word that is circulating. It's kind of in vogue right now. Our time has come. Human age reversal is real. You just heard Steve Perry put on a presentation where age reversal was demonstrated by replacing just one young protein. Just think what happens when we replace all 700 proteins that we think are involved in keeping young people healthy and vigorous. This is why our Society for Rescue of Aged Persons has been formed. It is a private association, nothing formal about it at all, but it's premised on the fact that aging is at least partially reversible using existing therapies today. And there's a growing interest in transforming this technology into clinical reality, meaning you can go to a doctor's office and he will enable you to grow biologically younger using some of the technologies that we described today. And we found through the various fundraising efforts that the people who are interested in this, well, they wanna be active in it. They just don't wanna put money into a black hole and hope something happens. They wanna put money into a project that will enable them to at least observe, if not actively participate in the rejuvenation benefits. And we understand that. So the most efficient way to advance age reversal research at this point is via the private association of like-minded individuals where we can open source information, just like Steve Perry did. He just, he just disclosed to you everything he knows about GDF-11, including the clinical biomarkers that are reversed, the anecdotal feedback from people who are on GDF-11, and some of the things he didn't tell you is that when these people run out of their supply, they start feeling older. They get really desperate for their next GDF-11 shipment because they don't like feeling biologically older. They don't like the aches and pains returning. They, 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 they like the impact of GDF-11. As far as I know, most people who have started it have stayed on it. And we want to now initiate a clinical study where Steve Perry will work with medical doctors and, and do a real world clinical study where people will get baseline measurements and then they will get on a GDF-11 and, and will look at how they are doing from a biomarker-based standpoint. And of course, listen to what they say as far as uh, how they're feeling. But the biomarkers, that's what we're gonna be looking at very, very carefully. So these are the age reversal human projects that we are most interested in seeing occur. And we don't really care who does it. Remember, this is just a private association where, where we are communicating information with each other. There's nothing here that is proprietary as far as I'm concerned, or, or perhaps with most of the people listening to this, though some people have some patents on some of this technology, which is fine. We, we, we want people to make money with their projects so they can fund even more research. I just wanna make a couple notations for people who have questions on, on, on the upper left-hand side of their screen, there's a little bar that says Q and A. If they want to ask any questions, I'm going to answer them at the end of this presentation, and it is going to end soon. Uh, but these are the therapies that we want to see funded. Now, this young plasma transfer via apheresis, that may already be, be being done in Northern California. So some of this research here is already going. This stem cell mobilized young plasma infusion, this is what we really consider the platinum age reversal technology. That's ready to go. All it needs is the funding. That's all it needs. Thymic regeneration, they've got an approved IND, investigational new drug application with the FDA. They did a proof of concept study with about nine people and they were able to document restoration, regeneration of the thymus gland and they're seeing improved immune responses because of that thymus gland uh, being regenerated. The thymus gland is the master gland of immunity. By regenerating the thymus gland, they were able to show a restoration 
of more youthful immune function. GDF11 restoration, that's what Steve Perry talked about. That is a study that people can talk about putting together and working with Steve Perry on. We're very excited to have people get on it because it's affordable. It's probably more affordable than anything else out here right now. And it's something that people can access real fast. The uh, purging senescent cells with senolytics, uh, there's some research that's gonna go on in that area, we believe very soon. But if anyone wants to say, I'd like to see that research go even faster, they should let us know. I'm gonna tell you before this conference ends how you can communicate with us. Of course, we're removing the cellular debris with rapamycin. We're gonna hear from some scientists as to how well they think that is working. So these technologies, they're all ready right now for human trials. No new drug has to be developed in order to initiate these human age reversal studies. That gets me real excited here. So here's our game plan. I want you to take a look at this screen because what you're gonna see are the areas that you can check off on a website I'm gonna show you in just a minute as to what you can do as an individual, what you can do as an individual to participate in this ambitious project to reverse aging in human beings. You're gonna see this on a website I'm gonna show you in just a minute. Again, this is the private association that we're naming Society for the Rescue of Aged Persons. I know there's a lot of charities out there. This is not even a charity, it's simply a private association of like-minded individuals who are going to share information with each other and hopefully put our collective efforts together to make human age reversal a reality. This is a biomedical renaissance. When people were in the European Renaissance, they didn't know it was a renaissance. They saw technology actually slowly occurring, but we already know what's happening. We can see the technology accelerating at a rate in which people are gonna live a real long time if we get the research done before our time comes. Uh, to quote Benjamin Franklin, he was such a futurist. There's so many predictions he made, by the way, but later turned out to be true, and he made some money on those predictions before he died, but he believed that at some point aging would be cured and our lives lengthen absolutely significantly. So again, our game plan here is to organize and put together people who wanna see this happen. What I'm gonna do now is jump to a website. I'm gonna to jump to a website that we put up called rescueelderly.org. I'm gonna put that up on the screen here so that people can see it. And here it is, right before your eyes. Brand new website, we put this together over the last seven days. We are in a hurry, in case you don't know, because every day we grow older, we grow closer to not being alive anymore. It's that simple. So we have, to, we have to accelerate everything we do. So you can look at this website anytime you want, but to join and participate with what we're doing, just hit that join button from the homepage, and that has that same list I showed you on the PowerPoint. And I'll go back to the PowerPoint in just a minute. That, goes, that has the same list of, of, of options. You can volunteer to accelerate human age reversal projects. And if you wonder, how can I volunteer to do that? Well, let me tell you a project we need to have happen. We would like to find a very reliable medical clinic in Tijuana, Mexico, one that's credible, one that does quality work. And we want to put some of our own people into that clinic to do some of the experimental therapies quick, fast, to do proof of concept studies. So if a couple people in the Southern California area want to communicate with each other and maybe take a trip down to Tijuana and spend the day, and make appointments and see some of these places, see if you can't find some doctors who want to make a little bit of money and also participate in a historic undertaking. Just one little example of how people can volunteer to accelerate human age reversal projects. Now, some people might want to self-experiment with novel age reversal approaches, and, and those are available. That's what Steve Perry's group is doing. They are self-experimenting. If you check that box off, we'll tell you some different ways that you can self-experiment with age reversal. I personally am doing three or four of them right now, so it's something that takes a little bit of time and effort, but I'm willing to do it, and I believe some of these are working. Uh, a physician, we have a number of physicians on the line right now, but you can become either a principal investigator or join the clinical research network. The more doctors we have offering these age reversal therapies, the more research we can do, the faster we can get clinical results. People who want to invest in for-profit entities, well, we want to hook you up. We want to get people together who want to put money in 
in order to accelerate this research. And they, those people might be looking for a financial return. I think some people will make a lot of money. That's not why I'm talking to you right now. I'm here to accelerate the research, period. But those people want to put money in, we're going to put them together with other people and hopefully create entities that will enable the research to be funded. People who want to donate, we'll let you know about nonprofits, 501c3 organizations where you can write tax deductible checks that will only be used to fund specific age reversal projects. In other words, you can indicate exactly where you want your money to go. You might like the stem cell uh, project where we mobilize these stem cells of young people, separate out their plasma, and give that to older people. That might be a project you want to fund, or maybe you want to fund some of the other projects. You allocate the money either way you want to the 501c3 organizations. And lastly, you might want to self-fund your own participation in an age reversal clinical study. That is not illegal. People are doing it nowadays where you basically pay the cost of the study and you participate. You have to go through all of the baseline testing and all the other clinical testing, but here it is. You have the ability to do that. So we're in good shape as far as being able to put together our private association and offer people a wide range of opportunities, opportunities that can enable them to personally be involved in accelerating the mission that we're doing. Now, a few notes that I wanna mention here uh, before we conclude, uh, and that is, there is, and this is again just a blow up of what you just saw there on our website, the different ways that you can participate in human age reversal. Uh, a co couple notes is that um, there is in San Diego, California, in August of this year, a conference called the Revolution Against Aging and Death. The, the acronym for that is RADFEST, R-A-A-D-F-E-S-T dot O-R-G. And we're gonna be having a summit at that conference with some of the leading scientists in the world and many of the activists, people like yourself who are tuned into this, this webinar, we're gonna have a lot of conversations about what we can do to accelerate human age reversal research. So if you're able to attend in mid-August uh, in San Diego, the Revolution Against Aging and Death Conference, uh, radfest.org is where you can log in, and if you do it by April 30th, you get a much lower rate than if you do it after April 30th. So check out that website, see if you can make that conference. I will be there personally, along with many scientists and many activists. You're gonna feel very comfortable amongst this group of people because they all wanna see biological aging reversed in elderly people. So I invite you to that conference and we're gonna schedule these webinars on a somewhat regular basis. We're gonna have a different scientist present. You heard Steve Perry talking about GDF 11 today. We'll probably have Greg Fahey talking about thymic regeneration. And beyond that, we've got some incredible projects that I can't even talk about right now. I'm sworn to confidentiality, but once those confidenti confidentiality requirements are lifted, we can bring additional people on board to discuss what they are doing to reverse human aging. And in most cases, they're already seeing results results that are exciting me enough to donate my time. This is not a profit-making venture for myself. I'm doing it as a volunteer. I frankly don't know what else I do with my time other than pursue age reversal research. So that, that's my motivation for putting these presentations together and hosting these webinars, which I'm grateful to do. But fortunately, we've got physician scientists who are doing some incredible work. And it's critical that you hear what they have to say because you're gonna understand that aging right now is gonna become a new paradigm as it relates to what direction it goes. We're gonna put it in reverse. That's what I've dedicated my life to, and we're gonna continue that. And I'm grateful that so many people have logged on, by the way, because this is the nexus, this is the, this is the very embryonic stage of a group that I think is gonna wind up growing into many, many thousands of people as we explore scientific methods for reversing biological aging in a way that we can rejuvenate elderly people. And at 62 years of age, I'm elderly. I could get a social security check right now. I wanna do something about my own aging process. And I think everyone on this webinar does. So I am going to conclude and you'll be sent out an email for the next scheduled webinar. We're probably gonna do these on Wednesday evenings. We'll do them once every two weeks, once a month. It just depends on the availability of the scientists. And I would look forward to everyone who's listened to this, who wants to participate, it's on your screen right now. There's a number of different ways that you can be part of this historic 
ambitious, uh, unprecedented uh, endeavor to extend the human lifespan in a way that will be alive when the true technology exists to enable indefinite healthy lifespans to become clinical reality. I want to thank everyone for participating, and I'll look forward to reading your comments on the website, Rescue Elderly, which is what we're trying to do, rescue them from the horrific consequences of aging and then the inevitability of death. We don't want that to happen. We want to rescue them. So rescueelderly.org, log on, express your interest, and we'll network you in with somebody who will be able to help. I don't really care about making money when my 62-year-old body is aging to death. I want to grow biologically younger, and then I'll worry about if I need to make more money doing it then. Thank you.